Today we have a distinguished speaker in our lecture series, and so I'm really excited to inter introduce Dr. John Swanson, um, who you can see from his introductory slide, was scheduled to be the distinguished speaker right, right after we shut down a couple years ago. Uh, and so this is your first visit back to Cornell since then. The first time here. Yep. And this so, afternoon was the first time I put a suit on in two years. Oh, right. And so he's going to put a suit on this afternoon for another event for the first time in two years. Um, so there's a lot to say about Dr. Swanson. Uh, he's a he's a undergrad and master's is from mechanical engineering here at Cornell. He did a PhD at University of Pittsburgh. Um, after that, uh, worked at Westinghouse for a while, and then he founded a company that is now called Ansys, which many of you have heard of. Little fun fact: as I was um, mentioning to my husband this morning that I was going to have breakfast with the speaker, who is John Swanson, and my husband said to me, Swanson, Swanson. Isn't he the finite element guy? <laughs> so, pseudo famous in our house. Um, and so he founded Ansys. Yeah, you, you've heard of me. Okay, that's, <laughs> that, I'll, I'll go with that. So, um, ah, but before, before becoming more of a business school person, he did groundwater contaminant dispersion modeling. So, that, that's the uh, finite element connection. Sorry, too much personal there. Um, <laughs> So, lots of things to talk about here. Um, key items, so he won the Fitz Medal in 2004, which is the highest engineering honor in the country and puts him in the same club with Westinghouse, Kelvin, Edison, Bell, that whole crew, right? So that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, and he's here with us today to um, give the seminar and then he's also gonna receive uh, the College of Engineering Distinguished Alumni Award later today, which is um, our highest honor from the college to an alumni. Um, this is based on lots of things, but after, uh, after he sold ANSYS in 1994, he really focused on the engineering education interest that he had, and so has continued to engage with Cornell through supporting education programs, uh, supporting um, uh, incubators and also being uh, on the board of trustees. So continues no nope. nope? engineering council. Engineering council. I'm sorry. Right. Engineering no. council. I saw a board of trustees coming, and I I, <laughs> du I ducked, so I avoided that one. Okay. Um, so he's been on the engineering council and is receiving the award for his you know distinction and vision and leadership to the college. Uh, and but please go ahead and look at his bio because I just give you gave you the the um, very quick highlights. But um, let's thank him for being here today and giving us this uh, talk on renewable energy progress. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really hate it when the introduction is longer than the talk. <laughs> And it has been known to happen. Anyway, as, as she said, uh, I'm, I'm two years late and a dollar short, but uh, what I, actually, I'm not a dollar short. Anyway, we're going to look at the traditional utility model, incorporation of renewables uh, in residences, electricity, pricing by utility, a bunch of subjects. Uh, the presentation, I believe, will be generally available you know, on whatever system. It's, you know, so you know, don't worry about taking notes or anything. Anything that's up here, you'll, you'll have available. Okay, the traditional utility model is fairly straightforward. You generate electricity, you transmit electricity, uh, you distribute it, and the consumer gets it. That's the one way top down that we've lived with for many years. Uh, so the customer just sees the distribution and the customer load. Uh, now customer loads have a variety of flavors. This will be useful in the future. Uh, there's schedulable loads. Uh, electric vehicles, which I talked about this morning, and hot water are two of the fairly obvious schedule load. There are adjustable loads, loads that actually don't have to be that particular instant. Uh, they can be delayed anything from a few minutes to a few hours. Uh, the heating HVAC, there's some inertia in the home, so you can you know, adjust that slightly. Refrigeration can, has a quite a long time scale. Uh, you could uh, do, uh, and you could do more with that. I'll talk about that later. And the laundry and dishwasher are things that you don't have to do with that particular instant. And then there's things you, you know, you got to have it now. You turn on the light switch, the lights had better come on. You know, there's no option. And we're pretty much the same with cooking, although I'm not sure that even happens anymore. It doesn't happen in my house. And, and entertainment, you know, and, and your computer and so on. There's stuff that you turn it on, it's got to be there. So let's talk about net metering and photovoltaics. Because, you know, my 
last five or ten years has been mostly photovoltaics. I've uh, switched from to that to electric vehicles, which was my lecture this morning. But photo, photovoltaics is in here, and uh, solar panels plug into the customer load. If solar, what did I do? Solar panels uh, go right into the box, and what you need, you use. What you don't need, the electric company gets. Uh, if they're nice, they'll pay you for it. If they're really nice, they'll pay you less price. If they're not, they'll take a modest fee for that. But it's reasonable because they're basically a big storage battery, and that's a useful technology. So, so net metering means basically that if you sell it to them, you sell it at the same price. Net metering will not last. Uh, the electricity is not that valuable coming in from some source as it is going out. So right now we're running nine and a half cents buy and uh, 11 and a half cents buy and nine and a half cents sell. And then, you know, I think that's reasonable. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. So net metering says basically if you generate more than you need, the utility takes it. It does, you know, there's a problem with electricity is if you've got more than you need, you got a problem. You know, you've got to put it somewhere or you put up big resistance heaters and blow it off in the sky. Uh, so it, it's a supply and demand problem. If you need more you're generating, you just buy from the utility at the current price provided the uh, utility not gone down or something evil like that. But it eliminates the need for local storage. So it has been a big, imp a big impetus for the growth of uh, individual energy. You, know, you've got, you don't have to have batteries. You don't have to balance your own load. You can just sell, send this to your neighbor or wherever. And it's pretty common. Uh, the utilities are not particularly fond of it. Uh, so net metering are going to go. The you know, diff price differential uh, dual meters will, will be the standard. I've actually you know, got, become less interested in photovoltaic because my interest was at the residential level. And now I've got the utilities putting in photovoltaics everywhere. And you probably could just buy it from the utility and not bother putting your own system in. So that's a good thing. And that's why I've moved on to electric vehicles. Remote net metering is also available. Remote net metering says you can generate it here and use it here. Uh, and that's opened up uh, the fact that the apartments don't have space. But you can buy a share in another site, and that credits against your electric bill. Again, that that's requires the utility to be more or less cooperative. And uh, that's, that's fairly common, but not everywhere. Uh, yeah, you could do windmills. This happens to be a company in Pittsburgh that has a vertical windmill. And if you had a windmill, you just plug that in the same way. You know, no difference. Again, you'd use net metering to take care of the excess or cover the shortage. Uh, now we get to electric vehicles. This is a fairly old slide. Uh, this, this is the Chevy Bolt. And those are the statistics they gave. Uh, the Bolt is also the one that's been known to catch fire. There's a, a current flap going on about fires in bolts. Uh, so I've had to modify my EV talk to account for the fact that bolts have, you know, my own personal modification, I have an e, a PHEV, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. And in my checklist for when I leave the home for a 10-day trip, I unplug my vehicle. You know, that, that's my adaption to that. Anyway, this is my vehicle, and I, I really love it. This is a plug-in hybrid. Now, it's not got a big range. It says in the spec 24 miles, but I typically go 35 miles on a charge. Uh, this, as I said in the lecture this morning, this is the way to go now. There's no range anxiety. Uh, most of your stuff is under 5 or 10 miles. Uh, a lot, the peak is, a lot about, is something you do on your bicycle easily, uh, but you know, so be it. So where does the electric vehicle go? It just plugs into my box. Uh, I could plug it into the 110 volt outlet, uh, but uh, being a purist, I, I put in a higher level charging. So now it takes me two hours to fully charge instead of four hours. But I charge at night, it doesn't make a whole bunch of difference, but at least I'm a little more current. Now there's some question on bi-directional. This, this is not a good idea. The, the bi-directional says you can use the automobile battery for something else. And to do so, you're going to avoid your warranty. Among, and probably wear out your battery sooner. Uh, now, you can't go bi-directional, but you can control the flow in one direction. You can choose to charge it at midnight uh, when the electricity is cheaper, rather than 9 o'clock in the evening when it's not cheaper. 
Uh, my particular strategy is I charge my car at 9 o'clock in the morning. Now that may sound a little strange, but I'm retired, so I don't do anything at 9 o'clock in the morning. But more importantly, I have solar panels on my roof, and in Florida the sun is shining at 9 o'clock in the morning, but the air conditioner's not running. So I would be selling at 9.5 cents, but instead I'm using the 9.5 cent, and so that works out. I called the electric company and said, when should I charge? They said, we don't care. So that, that was not particular, because there's no time of day pricing or anything in, in our particular area. So they just said, you know, plug it in wherever you want to. But uh, I have a, a slight incentive to charge uh, at a certain time. Now, if you're, if you're going to be in Florida or anywhere where the weather is sometimes iffy and sometimes bad, you might want, and I, might want a generator. And I see several of these in the area when I, where I bicycle. And so you plug that in as well. And that goes in the same place. Again, it comes into the box. If for some reason you're generating more than you need and the network is up, I'm not sure why you would be doing that, but you would sell it back to the electric company. Now, another point I want to make on this slide is this little item over here, this fast charge. Erase that. That's, that's in a two-year lag, that goes away. Uh, fast charge is, is 480 volts. You can't get 480 volts in your house. You know, so you really you can't do fast charging at the, at the residential level. Uh, you can do only uh, 240 volt charging. Uh, 40 amp, 240 volt is about as high as you go. That's what I put in. I can't use it because my, my car only charged at 15 amps, but I've got 40 amps available for my, ne my next car, whatever that might be. Unfortunately, we're moving. You know, the next person who lives in the house has those advantages. Now, uh, what's coming, and it is coming, is storage batteries as part of the electrical distribution in the house. Now, it's coming either because the price of batteries comes down low enough, or we begin to get a lot of excess auto batteries that have lost, 80, lost 20 percent, but still have 80 percent left, and they're sort of useful to use in your house. So if, if you did that, then you put your battery as the center. Everything charges the battery or everything goes through the battery. Um, and then you still got the same things. If you've got excess, uh, the battery's fully charged, you're still generating, you send it off to the utility. Uh, so that part of the picture remains the same, but now you have that storage. So now if the power goes out, you're really in good shape because you've got a fairly sizable resource. Uh, you might be able to live up for two or three days on your battery. Now let's talk about how, how the, Battery, how electricity is charged for. Residential electricity is fairly reasonable, or fairly easy. You, you buy a kilowatt hour, you pay for a kilowatt hour. But of course, uh, with, with the onset of photovoltaics, uh, the utilities have said, well, if you're not, I have a net zero community, I don't buy electricity. But the electric company is still connected, and, and so they want something out of it, so they're not charging a dollar a day, or some other number. Uh, which is uh, $20 a month or, so, or some number. It was $20 a month, now it's a dollar a day. You know, so that it's, it's going up. But that, you know, that's not too bad because that's what they've got to do. We still want the utility companies here. Uh, now, our, my bill has a power cost adjustment. Uh, that says basically the electric company can make the bill smaller anytime they want to. Uh, they don't have to go through the Public Utility Commission and everything. So they got this floating number that moves up and down based on how much they're paying for their fuel. Uh, and they also have an extra charge when you go over 100 kilowatts hours per month. So notice it's 13, and a half, 13 cents as opposed to 11 cents. So you get a surcharge. And you know, probably not a bad idea, especially us people who have solar, we rarely go above that. Uh, so it's a good idea then. Somebody else is paying. Uh, it's not quite net metering because we're selling at uh, nine and a half cents and buying at either 11 or 13, but not bad. Well, where the difficulty comes in is when you go to commercial rates. Uh, because if you go commercial rates, you get another item on the bill, and that's called demand charge. And demand charge is going to be very important in the next few years as we try to figure out how to power electric vehicles. Demand charge basically says that the most you use in any 15 minute interval in any month or whatever your billing cycle is, you pay a fee for that. And that's a dollars per kilowatt uh, uh, fee. Uh, 
at its high. It's five, in this particular case, it's $5.75 for that peak. Uh, typically, that is uh, 10 to 50% of the bill. Uh, and I happen to be the treasurer of the temple, and the temple meets on Friday nights. The sun doesn't, unfortunately, shine on, on Friday nights. We don't have that good a pipeline. Uh, so basically, I can't convince the Jews to move to daylight services, so every Friday night we get a peak demand charge. Uh, and it, it's a big one. But if, if everybody plugs in their electric vehicles when they come to work at 8 o'clock in the morning, the demand charge is going to be enormous. Uh, because although my car runs flat, I understand Teslas run a high peak and then dr drop off as they charge. So if you have 10 Teslas plugging in all at once, uh, forget your demand. No, something's got to be adjusted. Something's got to fall. Now, there's a, a lot of other things floating around. Uh, one of the most common is time of day pricing. Uh, you have that here, is my understanding. Uh, that says basically at some time, electricity is cheaper. Uh, beware of that, uh, utility companies, because everybody with an electric vehicle knows that at midnight it gets cheaper, so they've programmed their car to plug in at midnight. Uh, can you imagine what 100 electric vehicles do to the electric demand as a spike? You know, this is exactly at midnight, and exactly at midnight, everybody turns on their cars. You know, they're all asleep, but the cars turn on. So, yeah, other strategies say, well, let's charge it so we get it charged by 7 o'clock and you know, back up the time. But then the problem is at 7 o'clock, or 6.49, everybody's charging, and you've got to, you know, so that's an unsolved problem. You know, we don't know where that's going to go and how to do that and how demand charges work and so on. But from the utility standpoint, yeah, the vehicles are coming. The utilities is going to have to find some way of dealing with that. So in the, in the future, I, th I think we're going to see more d dynamic pricing. What we need to know is what's the price going to be over the next 24 hours or in the next week. And then we can modify our behavior or programming opportunity, you know, program systems that run our electric uh, house uh, in a way that minimizes the cost. Yeah, you can do it manually, but it gets very tiresome very quickly. Yeah, I don't want to go out and plug in my car at 12 o'clock. Fortunately, my car is programmed, so it'll, it'll plug itself in. But there's options open for a smart energy house, how to schedule loads, electric vehicle. All the variable loads are available as resources. Plus, I think there are things you can do to make them more variable or more useful. For example, if the refrigerator is full, uh, it, does, it has a longer time constant than if it's empty. Uh, so if you put uh, you know, high uh, phase change materials or something in the insulation, you can make it a much longer cycle. Water heating is, is not a difficult thing because when I was a child, we had a hot water heater that ran at night. And you know, that was okay, but if you used, ran out of hot water, it was the next day when you had hot water again. Uh, the other side of that is if the power went out, then the, then the clock shifted and you got hot water during the daytime instead of at night. But hot water heating is a useful and well understood way of moving loads. Business opportunities then, smart home controllers, uh, something. The, putting the batteries in is interesting, but managing it appropriately is going to be a real opportunity. And then, you know, Work is going there. That's happening. You know, you know, we can do that. I'm seriously considering. We're moving in a couple months. I'm seriously considering putting a battery in the new home, uh, not because I need it, because I've got to figure out how they work too. Because if I don't know how they work, then my lecture, you know, d degrades over time. Uh, but high thermal inertia in the refrigerator, high thermal inertia residences, all sorts of ways of just smoothing the, the curve, uh, demand curve. So moving on, then the next level up is the microgrid. And there's a lot of activity going on looking at microgrids. And th this is my concept of what is in a microgrid. Uh, you've got a bus or something. Uh, you've got solar power, which could be community solar. Community solar is that thing out there that's feeding here. Now, Cornell is blessed because it's got land everywhere. You know, Cornell can put solar fields pretty much anywhere. Uh, but University of Pittsburgh, which is you know, where I got my PhD, is sitting in the middle of town. You're not going to put solar panels. We've got a few on the roofs, just for show. Uh, 
but you know, basically we need a field somewhere else. Power purchase agreements and all that stuff. You know, this, that's under control. Uh, you can put it, your wind and whatever else, uh, but you have to have batteries. Now you don't have to have enough batteries to run the system continuously. You've got to have enough batteries for emergency use, the hospitals and, and those needs. So that gets into the question of how you're going to prioritize the loads you know, so you don't just shut everybody off. Uh, now that's done now because the generation is local. The hospital has its own generator. The uh, grocery store has its own generator. Uh, so the, you know, some of that's done, and in case of emergencies, that's useful because you've got some generation available. But then the transmission grid is still there. In other words, uh, this is not standalone all the time. It ha it's connected to the grid both ways, again, bidirectional. But basically, you're running maybe 20% locally and 80% from the grid or some number. But you can disconnect uh, and run locally some amount of your load for some amount of time. So that's the stability of having a microgrid type of architecture. And that, of course, is being uh, seriously explored. Now, batteries, you know, the, the current holy grail, shall we say, of energy is batteries. You know, we need better batteries for any number of applications. And they're coming. You know, tremendous technology advancement. My magic number for solar panels was a dollar a watt. You know, the utilities are about 38 to 40 cents a watt now. So we've, yeah, yeah that, that's a done technology. Uh, my number for batteries is $100 per kilowatt hour. Uh, now, can we get there? Uh, current numbers for automobile batteries are actually as low as $137. Now, as engineers, we know that a factor of two is nothing. You know, we're, we're almost there. And in fact, production itself, uh, somebody's law, I forget who, says every doubling of production cuts 20% off the price. So we need only two doublings of production to get to $100 a kilowatt hour. And electric vehicles are so small a volume, a couple percent, that getting to 10% would drop the battery price to $100 per kilowatt hour. Now, if you're talking about utility batteries, of course, they don't have to be weight limited. Uh, you can use all sorts of technology at the utility level because the batteries, be they flow batteries or whatever they are, they just sit there quietly on their concrete pad and do their, their work. And, you know, so those are some of the benefits that accrue to the utility by having batteries available. I, here's, you know, look, let's see, I've got the date on here somewhere, it's old. Uh, it's about a 2014. And so this was a projection of how the price of batteries is going to fall. And that's based on how the price of photovoltaics sell. Now, but notice the numbers. Uh, this shows that by somewhere around now, we might be at 250. And we're actually at 137. And all those dots are numbers that came out after the vertical line is when this study was done. The dots are numbers that are actually on the market. In, you know, I picked up off from, you know, if I want to buy a big utility battery, that's what it would cost me. Uh, so you see the $100 number is down halfway to the bottom. Uh, but 137, which is where I believe we are now for automobile batteries, which are the most expensive type of batteries. Yeah, we're well under that curve. The, the, uh, I, I'm going to have to drop my 100 to 50, uh, like I had to drop the dollar a, a watt down to 40 cents a watt. Now, sad tale, I had invested in a uh, photovoltaic company that was working to a dollar a watt. And unfortunately, you know, yeah. We're at 40 cents a watt, and the company doesn't exist anymore. So, but you know, I, I being the optimist, said, well, we achieved our goal. Uh, we'll fold our tent and go away and, and declare victory. So we're declaring victory. I'm declaring victory. There's some other people who lost more money are not declaring victory. But. OK, there, there's a lot of money being thrown into this. I won't read this to you. But basically, the Department of Energy is funding all sorts of battery development in addition to the volume of production. A lot of things say this is a not yet solved, but clearly within the next five years, uh, we have the solution. So what does the pool utility company do? Well, the pool utility company is no longer a coal-fired plant 
uh, sending electricity over the wires. Uh, the utility company now has uh, some coal, which uh, I think out of Florida we're done with coal now. We've still got some natural gas. We've got gas turbines. We've got a lot of PV solar farms. Uh, not much wind. It, does, it doesn't get particularly windy in Florida, but it does other parts of the country. Uh, we've, no hydroelectric at all in Florida because it's, nothing is very high. There's no elevation. But Canada has a really lot of uh, hydroelectric. Uh, geothermal, I'm not sure where that goes, but uh, Cornell seems to be interested in geothermal, so we leave it on the slide. Uh, yeah, we, we have a difference of opinion as to exactly what Cornell should be doing, but I won't go into that. And we've got nuclear power. That, even that is an unknown. We don't know where that's going. Are the small modular reactors going to come up? and take apart and so on. But whoever's running it has to have all these factors in their minds. This is, you know, this is not an easy task as to decide what to do. But there's more to it than that as well. Because over here, you know, we've got the book customer now. You know, we're still there. We try to get to the customer. But look on the other side. Uh, I'm going over here so I can try to, never mind, I can't read it. Okay, the big item here, batteries and ultra capacitors. These are instantaneous uh, energy sources. I had a group of students looking at the problem, or the opportunity, shall we say, of using solar panels to stabilize the grid. Because solar panels are interesting because they've got almost no inertia. So you can, you can turn panels on and off uh, at, uh, within milliseconds. And you know, whatever peak you've got, you can, as long as the sun is shining. You know, bear in mind, solar panels only work when the sun shining. Well, if the sun is shining, you could run your field at 75% and give you a 25% reserve. It's called spinning reserve. It's not spinning, but it's still the name for it. So, so that's an opportunity. Pump storage, uh, that's hydroelectric, but with the uh, pump, the turbines turn backward to pump water uphill when you've got excess energy. Now, California is the only place in the States I know of that has a real problem with excess energy. Uh, but as more wind and more solar come online, more and more people are, are going to have to find ways of getting rid of energy as opposed to uh, generating it. Europe has had more problems with this, and I'll talk about the European solution a little later. Uh, of course, utilities can share. You know, we, ha we have a diverse group of utilities, none of which want to share, but certainly you know, we can figure out how to do that. I have a couple questions there. But the, the last item is the one I find interesting. That's the controllable loads. Are there loads that chew up energy uh, at, 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 at will? And among them, okay, response time, you know, those are you know, typical times, tens of seconds, seconds, minutes, and hours. Uh, nuclear power is not really variable. You just put them online and let pump the power out. Coal power plants, uh, they're, they are going away. You know, a lot of progress has been made. Um, geothermal, I'm not sure what its time scale is, so I put a question mark behind that. Okay, controllable loads. Let's, let's just talk about a few of these because I think th this needs some study. Uh, water purification is my nicest controllable load because you get a benefit as well. Now, the problem with, with controllable loads is the utilization of the load is not 100%. You know, there's a cost of having a water plant which is not purifying water. You, know, you can make, purify it more cheaply. But if you can get free energy, you know, that, that tips the scales and says, well, I'm willing to, to just use it when they're giving me energy, trying to get rid of energy. And that makes some sense. Electro, you know, here's another one. This, this one is big as well, but it's not quite clear where this falls. Uh, you know, and Cornell is very interested in hydrogen, I've, I've heard. But I, I was interested to call last week with Lyndon, and basically he he didn't know there were that, that many different colors of hydrogen. We know about gray hydrogen, we know about green hydrogen, but apparently there were other colors as well, which I don't know about, but anyway, interesting subject. Uh, you can store large quantities, but currently I don't think hydrogen it is a, a, a solution because we don't have the, the network. Uh, just, just like uh, biodiesel, you know, it's a fleet solution where you've got one place where people come and go, not you don't do interstate uh, using biodiesel. You don't do interstate doing hydrogen. You know, same problem. You, we've got enough problem getting the electrical network adapted to, electric, to vehicles. Hydrogen is not, not going to happen. 
Uh, but if you've got a, a gas, a steel plant, which you've converted to hydrogen, you know, you can use excess electricity to make the hydrogen run the steel plant. You know, so there are opportunities, but you, you don't, it's not a general solution in my opinion. Uh, other opportunities, uh, controllable loads. Uh, parking garages, you know, if you, if you say I need the car at 5 o'clock, then you've got some flexibility to use it to charge the car when the sun is shining, uh, for example. Uh, company and university. I notice the university's got two parking slots. Uh, that's, that's progress, but not a big progress. And I was talking to some individual, not to be named, who takes the Tesla in at night and parks it overnight in the parking garage. Uh, airport parking lots are a huge resource. You know, lots of vehicles. But, you know, so you, you, all you'd have to do is say, I'm going to be back Friday at 5 o'clock. And then you've got a resource. Again, don't take electricity out of the cars. That's a no-no. But you can put the electricity in cars as much as you want, as long as you meet the departure time. If you don't, you're in trouble, because I can't get home, and it's your fault. Uh, there, there are other controllable loads. Some utilities have actually explored. Uh, you pay, you pay less for your electricity, but they have the option of turning it off for short periods of time, like the air conditioning is showing. Air conditioning might go out for 10 minutes uh, during some, no more than two hours. You know, there are rules. Uh, residential hot water. Uh, some industries are, have very low rates because they can shut down for several hours at a time in time of peak usage. So those are controllable loads from an administration side. So, you know, who, who's going to end up doing all this stuff? Uh, well, you know, I think there may be something where the distributor becomes the control zone. And because they've already separated the generation from the distribution. So you can have de generators and distributors. And I'm not sure that the generators are in charge anymore. I think the distributors are in charge. Uh, so I'm not sure how whatever that category of business is, how that comes about and moves in and takes over or whatever. But basically the, the distributor says, where can I get cheap energy and where can I sell it expensively? And how do I get it from here to there? And where's my profit margin? A point I made this morning is follow the money. You know, whatever is gonna happen, there has to be an economic reason for it. If I'm gonna be a distributor, I've gotta be able to buy low, sell high. If I can't do that, you know, it's not an interesting opportunity. A storage is a resource, and storage, you know, you know, at $100 per kilowatt hour, I could put in a big battery farm in California, buy low and sell high and make money. You know, just, just by the, the service I'm providing. But, you know, but of course, too many, you know, that, that's a defeating purpose because too many people do that, the price differential goes down, and you're out of business. So you have to look at the future. Now, one of my big items that I want to see is a national grid. You know, I think Texas might even be behind that now, although they've been isolated for several years. It would be really nice if we could just turn a switch and buy from the East Coast to the West Coast. There's three grids, basically, East Coast, West Coast, and Texas. And Texas has shown the problem of being too, too small a grid. Okay, so we got solar in the Southwest, we've got wind energy, central U.S., and offshore is coming. You know, they're, they're more and more offshore. Offshore is good from an energy standpoint because the market and the generation are very close. Uh, hydro uh, and pump storage, uh, Northwest is big in hydro, uh, and Canada is big in hydro. And you know, we really need to talk to Canada. Actually, we need to talk to the U.S. individuals who, you know, not in my back, the NIMBY people, because they're, the latest uh, solution is to run a cable from Canada over around Maine, down the coast, and into New York City. You know, that's economic, you know, you know, there's no NIMBY, and it's cheaper to do that. That's not the answer. So cost is a national grid issue. Uh, pro probably, and this is the big Achilles heel, probably requires massive federal support. But we did it with the interstates, and if this is worth enough, we could do it. But I don't think it will happen. But I think there's other things that uh, make it happen. Uh, first of all, there's technology. High voltage DC, most likely. Um, it needs to be buried. You don't want that amount of resource sitting up on wires where somebody can do something evil to it. Uh, you need security. 
Uh, and you need some sort of a, a corridor or something so you can change the wires or put more wires in or manipulate it. So, you know, my favorite one is the interstate if the government's going to do it because then they already own it and nobody can complain. So you can just go ahead and do it. But this, that's not all. There are pipelines. Uh, there are a lot of pipelines everywhere. And if you dig up there and put some more stuff down, probably not a big issue. Uh, interesting one is the railroads. Uh, the question I ask is, where is the internet? You know, the, there's a network, but where is it? Have you ever seen the internet, the physical structure of the internet? And if the reason it, it's buried on the railroad lines. I know that for a fact because they're moving a rail line in Florida, and the article said they've got to worry about moving all the internet lines as well. So no, no NIMBY over internet. Everyone the internet, and, it, and you don't see it, so therefore no problem. Uh, now, clearly, a big high voltage line uh, is a little bigger, but it's not that big. You've got plus here, minus here, and a railroad in between. And in fact, I just read an article, a Sioux line, Sioux Green Line, uh, there's a consortium that's putting a middle, middle of the country to the east uh, along that line. So some, somebody's finally figured this out. Uh, and even the high voltage right of ways, you could, take, you could put equivalent to pipelines on those right of ways. And I think that I think they can do it, but I wouldn't check the legality of it. I don't, the, the contract with the landowner might have said, you know, too much as opposed to the land as opposed to what you do with the land. But they're, you know, they're up, it, it's not an insolvable problem. Now, a question I raise, and I don't have an answer, but I'd like to, you know, people in the audience can think about this. Could we actually do an AC network? Uh, and that way, a lot of good things would happen. If I'm doing microgrids, I could come and go at leisure because I can tell time down to the fraction of a millisecond. So every, every point in the country could be assigned a time that, that their utility peaks. But, but I got into a problem with this because 3,000 miles is a full cycle of AC uh, as far as speed of light. And so I'm not quite sure how this works. So I, I just present this for somebody to think about that knows more about it than I do. Uh, Europe is much ahead of us. There's no question that they've, you know, they, you know, I don't know why, because they've got separate countries and they've got governments and so on. Uh, but they, they're high voltage DC cables connecting many of the countries. And Sweden buys excess Europe wind energy and reduces their hydro production. And wind is low, they increase the higher production and send it the other way. Uh, it's very similar to Canada and the US, although Canada you know, they're not actually absorbing energy as in pump storage, but they could. You know, they're, they're, just, you know, they're just throttling them down to match the amount that's coming in. So why not Canada and the US? Uh, I'm not sure you can see this clearly, but this is the North Sea Energy Islands. And it, it's, we've got England, France, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, all being interconnected with high voltage DC lines. Uh, and that is, you know, I've, I've seen some of the lines already in place, uh, mainly in Denmark, Sweden, and Germany is also in there. So all, all this stuff gives you the ability to adjust the loads based on capability and so on. So the future, I, I think we're going to have to connect the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and the U.S. in general. You know, I think that the, you know, in spite of what the utilities think that they are local zones, they're no longer local zones. It's a a nationwide problem. And the economics is there. If the Canadians are willing to sell us free hy uh, cheap hydro, uh, there's a, that's a big driver. We should be able to take that. Uh, wind farms, dynamic pricing, large solar fields, storage everywhere from the residential storage up to the local, you know, wherever that uh, junction line is, some storage there and so on. Now, all that requires programming technology and everything to make it work. And remember, if you do the programming along, you screw up royally. You, know, you get a blackout over the whole you know, US. So you know, be a little careful if you're getting into that field because the consequences can be. Now, here's one I'd just like to leave with you. Uh, we need to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we're studying carbon capture, which in my opinion is such a dumb thing to do. Uh, the carbon is already underground. It's been there for millions of years. And why, why don't we just leave it there? You know, why, why should we dig it, out, dig it out, burn it, capture the residual, and put it back there? 
you know, that doesn't sound like the net effect is positive. Uh, it just looks like we're doing more and more energy to get to where we were in the first place. Now, it's not without precedent. We pay farmers not to produce food. You know, why don't we pay the mining companies not to mine coal? Now, you don't pay them what they want to be paid. You pay them, you pay them what they're going to suffer through when, when we cut the carbon back down. You know, so you pay them. You, know, you can get a little bit now or nothing in the future. That's the deal. Uh, and you know, what the numbers are remains for somebody else to determine. But you know, why the heck are we digging it out, burning it, and putting it back? I don't understand that. So anyway, renewable energy, we've got the problem the sun doesn't shine. Now, if you want to go really high tech, you can put solar panels in space and beam the stuff down to Earth. I don't see that happening. Uh, low cost storage will give us a lot of new opportunities. And I just wiped out my screen, and that's good because that was the end of the lecture. <laughs> well, open to questions, comments, discussion. And some of you are joining me at lunch. Some will be joining me at lunch, and uh, uh, I'll see you then. Uh, we've got time for a couple of questions, I believe. It's always hard to get the first question, but bear in mind the time, you may not get your question in. When you're talking about carbon recapture, are you talking about entropy? Basically, that entropy is always being increased? Well, basically, it, it's not going to be cheap to capture carbon. Right. You know, the, the, the best place to capture carbon is where the density is highest, which is at the out, output from the, carbon, from the generating plant. But we don't, want, we don't need those generating plants anymore, so we've got to capture carbon from the air where it's very dilute. And I don't see us doing that without energy. You know, it, it doesn't just naturally segregate itself out and pile up on the ground. You've got to pour energy. So we're aggravating the problem. Uh, so it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, it makes sense, you know, again, follow the money. There are people who are making money in the present system. Uh, so you know, it's not a let's fix this just by, you know, by saying John thinks it's a good idea. You know, we have a, a much bigger problem with somebody with a much bigger hammer than I have to make it happen. Other questions? Lyndon has a question on Zoom. Sure. Hi, Lyndon. Oh, hang on. We can't hear you, though. Oh, <laughs> well, that's an easy one. <laughs> Hi, Lyndon. I can see you. Yeah, I, there we go. Hey, so, um, look, so you, you, know, you alluded to the fact that um, you have some thoughts on what you know, should do. Yeah. yeah and, um, Happy to share them with you. Yeah. If I were to overlay, you know, the sort of seasonal... Yeah, this, uh, Lennon's question is, how about the seasonality? You, you do have seasons here. Uh, actually, I take that as a, you really don't have an electrical problem, you've got a heat problem. And I think if we re rephrased it as mainly a heat problem, we opened up a whole new bunch of research as how do you store heat uh, and make it available, how long can you store it, how cheaply can you store it. Uh, and also, that's a, uh, a variable load. Uh, it will be not in the far f distant future when people are trying to get rid of electricity at some point in time, at some time of the year. And we ought to be in a position so we could use that uh, excess electricity to charge our thermal batteries. So I, th I think Cornell needs to look at uh, the interesting question of how do you do something efficiently in a cold climate? You know, we're uniquely positioned for such a question, as far as I can see. Yes. So I, I, I would like to ask you about your idea of a sort of national grid. Yes. Because, you know, much as I dislike what's going on in Texas, I think they've done in general a very good job, except for last February. Yeah. And yeah. what they need is some stricter regulation on, you know, what, you, what, what conditions you have to be able to deal with. But um, we have a system that's highly balkanized in terms of running the grid. So the eastern interconnection is all connected. Yes. But it's a, it's a horrible mishmash. Well, it's 100 years old, and it, it just grew. And, and I'm not sure it's ever possible to redo it. You're going to have to adapt it somehow. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, you want more of that? Where is no, I'm not want more, more of that. I just want some big wires that tie the grids together. Yeah. So that, uh, you know, see the sun moves through the sky. And it would be nice if we could follow it uh, as opposed to, well, it's sunny in the east, but it's, it's not in the west. 
That was a uh, plan 20 years ago when they gave up on transmission corridors. I mean, maybe it could happen. Yeah, well, uh, there are a few. The, uh, the Sioux line is, uh, you know, I'm not sure it'll happen. There is a, a northwest to Los Angeles DC line. You know, so there are places yeah, where, yeah, yeah, yeah. where it is economic. And New York would like this. Uh, New, New York to Canada would be an yeah. ideal uh, corridor because there's a lot of power up there and a lot of power usage down there. Now, of course, the offshore wind is going to shift the picture. So again, yeah, where is the money and where, what are the benefits? Um, so, yeah, you know, the advantage of giving talks like this, I say anything I bloody please. And, you know, and if I'm right, you say, oh, he said that. And if I'm wrong, you forget. So uh, it, works out, it works out well for everybody. Uh, one last question. Last opportunity. Going once, twice. Ha. Yeah, you're, you're good. Um, so I wonder what, what do you think about uh, like potentially uh, a peer to peer market where you trade your, you have like a local mar electricity market where you sell your electricity local? Uh, well, I think that's where the distributor comes in. The distributor is trying to buy low, sell high. You know, so he's a market that you can sell to him as long as you're willing to meet whatever price he's offering at that point. I'm not sure you want to get into Joe down the street and needs electricity. I've got a little extra. I need to, to do that. I think somebody has to run that operation. And that, that's the category I call distributor. Yeah. They're the market makers. You know, they, uh, they, they, they look ahead and say, you know, and if they have batteries in their system, then, then they're a much more flexible market maker. You know, they can look at you know, how much battery charge have we got and how much are we willing to pay to charge the batteries a little bit more. So it's a whole other business opportunity as far as I can see, uh, but I think it is a, a large-scale opportunity as opposed to a peer-to-peer -peer opportunity. But you see the distributor is the role, who can play the role of distributor? Is it new? new well, you, you, you know, there's somebody that says, this, I think I'll start a business of, of uh, marketing electricity, and I will need batteries, I will need uh, deals uh, with people to buy from, people to sell to, and those people may be utilities, you know, utilities may sell or may buy, depending upon. I don't know how, how it sorts out, but again, follow the money. And if there's money to be made, uh, there's an opportunity for a business. So, just to follow up on that, so the distributor wouldn't own infrastructure? A uh, distributor might or might not. Okay. They might be the, the network, or they, the, somebody else might be running the network and just bring the electricity to them and take the electricity away. Okay. You know, open question. It might be, some might be one or some might be another. changes the options change right so so if one goes even to the sort of national model if you're thinking yes yes further to the international model then things like nuclear fission become quite plausible right they become plausible but they're, thir they're 30 years off and always have been always will be <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry fit yeah I'm, I'm thinking fission too but i've been thinking fission for a lot of years and uh yeah, I've, I've done, so, yeah, finite elements are very active in fission. I'm sorry, I'm talking over you. No, well, I'm thinking that if you've got the benefits of remote locations, in fact, even locations that are buried underground, where we test um, nuclear weapons anyway, it just seems to me that, you know, the option landscape changes, the amortization landscape, and things like solar and batteries change, and so you may end up with a completely different outlook as these policies yeah, I would agree, but I think the time scale is such that uh, uh, it's, it's not for 20 years that we'll see, or 30 years that we'll see uh, fit, uh, fusion. And by that time, you know, where it fits into the market will depend upon whether it's successful or not. So I, I don't worry too much about uh, what I don't know and fit, uh, Nuclear fission is something that uh, yeah, it, it, it's been a long time coming and it's still a long time coming, I think. So I'm, I'm not going to be sidetracked with the dream of fission, even though I'd love to be. Anyway, we have to break. break. Uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your attention.